All right, welcome, and thank you for joining us for the next installment of our webinar series, and today we're focusing on student medical issues. So before we get started, there's just a few housekeeping items to address. Um, first, to the left of the presentation slides, you're going to have the ability to type and submit questions. So please feel free to ask questions throughout the program by using that feature. Um, we'll try to get to any of the questions we can um, today. And then everyone logged into today's program will receive an email that includes a link to a recording of the webinar, today's presentation, and a survey if you could fill those out. Um, so my name is Emily Tellick, and I'll be presenting today with Jennifer Smith. Jennifer and I are both members of the firm's higher education and K-12 practice group. Our practice involves representing education clients on a wide range of issues, including matters related to student rights and special education, which we're going to be talking about today. And just in case you aren't familiar with Franzic, we're a boutique law firm located in Chicago, and we focus on labor, employment, and education law. So our firm has one of the largest teams of K-12 education lawyers in Illinois. We work with school districts, schools, and cooperatives of all sizes, ranging from hundreds to hundreds of thousands of students in all areas of the state. And forensic attorneys have decades of experience representing public and private research institutions, community colleges, liberal arts and graduate schools, academic medical centers, and profit higher education institutions. We work closely with in-house counsel on a wide range of higher education law issues from day-to-day -day counseling to high-stakes litigation, internal investigations, and audits. So on that note, let's get started. Thanks, Emily. And this is Jennifer again. Thanks for the introduction. Today we're going to be focusing on student medical issues. So to start off, we wanted to start where um, legal obligations really began to increase for schools around medical issues, and that was a federal case that came out of Cedar Rapids, Iowa, which always, um, that, that's about 45 minutes from where I grew up, so for some reason every time I see this case I reminisce about Iowa a little bit. But um, what happened was there was a student who um, required some significant services and in the range of, I think, um, uh, uh, he required a urinary uh, uh, cat, I'm going to trip over the catheter. word, catheter. <laughs> and the question was, um, does, is that something that the school needs to do during the day or does that preclude the student basically from accessing public education or is it basically the, the, the parent's obligation? Does it go too far to require school to do that? And w what the court really found as um, determinative was the question of whether or not the parent could be trained as a non-medical person to do it. So who's doing it when the student's at home? Um, if it's something that only a doctor can do, and, and um, then a school does not need to do it. If it's anything that a parent, a lay person, can be trained to do and is doing, then a school does need to do it. So um, that continues to be really the guiding star when it comes to medical services in the school. For the most part, we're going to talk about evaluations, which are different, but for day-to-day services, if the parent can be trained, so can someone from the school, and it is something that is obligated. So we're going to start by talking about some of those related services, such as administering medication while students are at school. So while there's several types of medications that can be administered at school, it's important to note that teachers and other non-administrative school employees, with the exception of certified school nurses and non-certified registered professional nurses, cannot be required to administer medication to students under any circumstances. So that means that only school nurses, registered professional nurses, or school administrators can be required to administer medication to a student. There may be some circumstances where other school personnel may also feel comfortable administering medications and may volunteer to do so. So for example, um, if you guys are having a, a field trip that lasts all day or over the weekend, um, you might have employees that feel comfortable doing so. Um, but it's important to remember that they can't be required to. Um, so as I'm sure you're all aware, the past six months have been a particularly active time for the Illinois legislature, and there have been a lot of significant changes in the education world as a result. So we're going to go through and review some of the new laws that affect students who have medical needs during school. And the first one we're going to talk about is Public Act, Public Act 101-0205, which Governor Pritzker signed back in August. 
Um, so the public act mandates that school districts permit a student with asthma, with an asthma action plan, individual health care action plan, Illinois Food Allergy Emergency Action Plan, and treatment authorization form, a Section 504 or an IEP, to self-administer med medication that's required by their applicable plan. And to allow a student to self-administer this medication in accordance with their plan, the public act requires the student's parent or guardian to submit written authorization for the self-administration self and written authorization from the student's physician or nurse. Um, so the public act also requires school districts to adopt an emergency action plan for a student who may be self-administering medication. And the emergency action plan essentially provides an alternative response for when the student isn't able to self-administer. And it would describe the circumstances where um, the school must call 911 in the event that that does happen. Um, there is also certain medications that school code requires schools to allow students to self-administer and self-carry. So those include asthma and allergy medications, such as an inhaler or an epinephrine injector or an EpiPen. Um, and in order to self-administer or self-carry asthma medication, the student's parent or guardian has to provide the school with written authorization for either you know, both the self-administration and self-carry of the asthma medication or just self-carry of asthma medication. Um, and then the parent and guardian or guardian must also provide the school with the prescription, with um, the name of the medication, the prescribed dosage, and the times and circumstances under which the asthma medication may be administered to the student. And then to allow a student to self-administer or self-carry epinephrine injectors, um, the school requires a little bit more than a parent authorization in these cases. So it requires written authorization from the student's physician, physician's assistant, or advanced practice registered nurse. And, um, and then the statement from the physician must also contain the name and purpose of the epinephrine auto-injector, the prescribed dosage, and the time or time at which or special circumstances under which the epinephrine injector is to be administered to the student. So it should really lay out, you know, if the student's allergic to peanuts, when, where, um, this might be an issue and how this would be used. So in addition to allowing students to self-carry certain medications, school districts can also, re can also supply um, medications in the name of the district uh, that they can use under specific circumstances. So for these medications, the person the medication would be administered to has not yet been designated. So you're going to hear us using the term undesignated medication when we talk about these that are maintained in the name of the school district. So according to the school code, districts may have supplies of undesignated asthma medication, epinephrine, glucagon, and opioid antagonists. And Emily, this is one of those, we, we keep seeing this list expand. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to be a relatively successful law, at least from the perspective of legislators. So if there's other medications people want to carry, for example, and think would be helpful, it seems there seems to be an appetite for that. Right. But um, we've only seen this, this list increase, not decrease, in the last five, five to ten years. Yeah, and like Jennifer's saying, glucagon was just added in this past six months and the legislative session. So um, it really has been expanding, and, and ISBE keeps trying to keep up as well with different guidelines and regulations to kind of um, discuss how to properly store and maintain and supply. So we're going to talk about some of that today. Um, so we'll begin by talking about asthma medication, epinephrine injectors, and opioid antagonists, and we're going to talk about glucagon shortly just because it is a little bit new. Um, so school nurses or trained personnel can administer, can administer undesignated asthma medication, epinephrine, or opioid antagonists to any person who they in good faith believe can be experiencing respiratory distress, an anaphylactic reaction, or opioid overdose, respectively, for each of those medications. And this applies while in school, at a school-sponsored activity, under the supervision of school personnel, or before or after normal school activity. So it's really a broad range of um, places where this can occur. And so how does the school maintain or store undesignated medication so it's accessible to anyone who might require it in all of these different circumstances? So it's these published guidance that kind of outlines the protocols for storing undesignated epinephrine and opioid antagonists. And they currently have a proposed guidance for protocols for the storage of asthma medication. 
The proposed guidance for asthma medication really tracks the opioid and the epinephrine injector guidance, so I'm going to talk about them together. Um, and it, it's safe to kind of say that your policies for all of these can pretty much be in line with each other. So in terms of storing undesignated medication, ISDE's guidance requires districts to describe the hours of the day, days of the week, and the school-sponsored activities when medication will be available. So it's important to note within this that districts are not required to have a school nurse or trained personnel available at all times or at all school-sponsored activities um, to administer these medications to students, but it should be really clear when and where medication will be available. And when it is available, there should be a trained personnel to administer it. Um, the guidance also requires that undesignated medications are stored in and available daily at one or more designated secure locations. And the guidance defines secure locations as an unlocked location that is not accessible to students and or is visually monitored by an adult during the normal school day under routine circumstances. So for example, that might be the nurse's office, the lunch room if you have um, like lunch, lunch people or lunch monitors, I guess, or the gym if these areas are kind of typically monitored. So if you always have personnel in gym or you always have personnel in the lunch room. Um, and if any of the undesignated medications are administered while at school, there's also um, notification requirements. So um, districts have various notification requirements that they have to follow. If an undesignated epinephrine injector or opioid antagonist is administered, um, it's a little bit different from asthma. So the school must immediately activate emergency medical services system and notify the student's parent, guardian, or emergency contact, and that's immediate. And then within 24 hours, the school must also notify the physician um, or physician's assistant or advanced practice registered nurse who provided the school with the standing protocol that we talked about earlier and prescription for the undesignated medication. Um, and again, that's for epinephrine or opioid antagonists. And then for asthma medication, the district has to notify the student, parent, guardian, or emergency contact and the physician or nurse who provided the standing protocol just within 24 hours. Um, so the school code also requires the district in, when it administers asthma medication to follow up with the school nurse or with parental consent, you know, notify the, the student's health care provider that these were administered. And Emily, uh, kind of a related question that we get a lot. So you have an emergency situation, you use this undesignated medication. In that situation, it's a situation where you might also call 911 for an ambulance, may or may not. Um, but th that's something we get questions a lot about because parents are often upset. You know, there's a big charge. Um, even if they're, they have insurance, it's, there's a big copay on ambulance rides. Um, that, that is your judgment call. If you think emergency medical services are required and exceeds, go back to what I said about that Cedar Rapids case. If, if something, if medical assistance goes beyond what you can do as even a nurse um, or certainly a lay person, don't feel constrained like the parent's not going to agree with this call, so I'm not going to call. Call. You know. It, Trust your gut on that because um, the the cases from a from a legal perspective, the cases where schools get in trouble are where they don't act. Mm -hmm. um, I've yet to see one where we were too cautious and got medical assistance. It turns out it wasn't required. Any day, I take that case over. You know, we were upset the parents would be mad, so we we just held tight. So certainly, just wanted to encourage you to trust your gut on those. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and I'm going to touch quickly on undesignated glucagon as well. So like I said, this was um, signed as Public Act 101-0428, which re actually revises the Care of Students with Diabetes Act to permit schools to maintain a supply of undesignated glucagon in these secure locations that are accessible to a school nurse or delegated care aid. Um, and they may administer the undesignated glucagon if they're authorized to do so through the student's diabetes care plan and if the student's prescribed glucagon is not available. So these are going to be pretty narrow circumstances where a student who knows they have diabetes doesn't have their, their supplies on them. But be aware that this is something that um, if your district is prepared and, you know, already is kind of 
able to have these supplies on, on hand, then um, that's something that you can do. And another topic that's garnered a ton of attention recently and has brought up a lot of questions quite understandably is Public Act 101-0370, which updated Ashley's Law. So as you may recall, Ashley's Law allows for the, for the administration of medical cannabis-infused products to students at school when the student is authorized to use the medication. So previously, before this, the, this new public act, the student's parent or registered caregiver had to actually come to school to administer the medication to their student and then take the medication off school grounds afterwards. But with the new law, students can self-administer medical cannabis-infused products under the supervision of a school nurse or school administrator, and it allows school nurses or school administrators to administer medical cannabis-infused products to a student if the district personnel has received appropriate training and written authorization from the student, parent, or guardian. Keep in mind that this law does not require school nurses or administrators to administer medical cannabis-infused product to a student, but districts now have the ability to do so. Um, all medical cannabis-infused product also must be stored with the school nurse and can't be self-carried by students, kind of as other medications like asthma um, or EpiPens can. And the Public Act also amended the Compassionate Use of Medical Cannabis Pilot Program Act to ensure that school nurses can't be arrested, prosecuted, or denied any right or privilege for administering or assisting with medical cannabis. Um, so this is an issue that's come up a lot, and I think we've gotten a lot of questions recently about you know, the conflict between the federal law and the state law and um, nurse licensure. So we're kind of waiting to see how, you know, ISB is going to be coming out with some regulations. We're kind of waiting to see what those regulations say, how this is going to be practically um, implemented in schools. Um, but we hear you guys, and we're, we're kind of looking out for all of that. We did get one question. How does a school, and this is from you, um, for, as a reminder, you are able to submit questions through, through, the, um, through your sign-in page. We got a question. How does the school district know if federal funding would be in jeopardy due to implementation of medical cannabis under Ashley's law. And that's a referring to a provision in the law that basically has a poison pill where if the federal government were to ever, um, if there was ever a basis for saying federal funding would be in jeopardy, then um, the, the law is ineffective. It is no longer in effect and the policies are no longer in effect. Um, the fact is we don't know. I think it's a fat question. So, for example, if we started to get Department of Ed sending out letters saying that your your um, uh, funding could be in jeopardy, possibly. What I don't know is if it's in other sectors. So, if they start going after the hospital systems first, and it's an indirect threat. Um, you know, we're going to have to just monitor that. Obviously, that's a, a really complicated issue where state law allows something and there's still federal restrictions. So good question. And, and the, the true answer is we just don't know yet. Um, we've also outlined these laws in great, greater detail on our special education blog, which is specialedlawinsights.com. So I'd encourage you to check out the blog and take a look at the articles on the new medication legislation for some more information. Um, but with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer for another new law that will be effective um, this year. Great. And that's the Delegated um, Care Aid for Seizure Plans. Um, this largely tracks so much like we saw the undesignated supply law expand. Um, this is yet a no, another new law. First we had diabetes, um, then we had asthma, now we have seizures. So that's expanding that care plan regime to um, seizures. So um, there's the official act. It goes into effect July 1. Um, it requires, much like the others, action plans, um, training for staff, delegated care aides. Where we get most questions around um, seizures and medication is around the emergency medication and the suppository and whether who can administer that. There's still some level of um, debate about whether that can be delegated to a non uh, staff person. One argument um, for allowing a, a non-nurse to administer is um, dependent on whether you consider the situation an emergency. 
in an emergency, anyone can um, give life-saving medication, and it's not uh, a violation of the nurse's um, uh, oversight and, and delegation. So that's been one kind of loophole that's been used in the past to allow, for example, others to oversee the administration during field trips. That will be something that, again, we'll look for those new plans to address how and who uh, medication will be provided by. So with that, uh, another major issue becomes a compliance with privacy laws and records laws about around medical issues because now you're often getting records directly from hospitals or obviously the care plans are signed by um, a physician often. So we're talking about actual um, medical records. But even though they are medical records, when the school has them, um, HIPAA does not govern. A lot of times we get um, parents or even attorneys that don't regularly practice in this area start citing uh, HIPAA obligations. A school district is not a covered entity under HIPAA. Instead, you need to just comply with um, the, the privacy laws you're used to in other contexts, FERPA, ISRA, and the mental health, the state mental health law. So another key issue as far as hot topics where especially nurses need to be on the lookout uh, for overall liability uh, protection for the district is mental health hospitalizations and child find. Um, we're seeing just a huge expansion of mental health hospitalizations for children, and often children that and and, and uh, that that are not they do not have IEPs, they do not necessarily have 504s. Maybe the first time you're learning about that something's going on is you have a week or two hospitalization. Um, you know, students getting passing grades, and it, it's something that you might usually consider sort of home issues, although obviously they're impacted, they're out of school for a significant amount of time for a mental health hospitalization. Th those hospitalizations should raise real red flags um, the, as far as child find, and, and a, at least a, a serious discussion about whether or not an evaluation is warranted. Um, what we're seeing is in hindsight, um, and in courts and to hearing officers, mental health hospitalizations are, are major indicators of a, a, a medical condition, a mental health condition that could certainly require um, or, or allow for an eligibility for a 504 and IEP. So if um, there, there needs to be at a minimum, you know, your team looking at whether an evaluation is warranted. If you have multiple mental health hospitalizations, um, it's hard to defend if a case study evaluation is not done to at least rule out the possibility of eligibility. Um, so definitely since sometimes nurses are the ones that see those and your whole team because of maybe parents are wary about sharing that information, um, definitely something to flag and, and think about. So with that, I'm going to ask um, Emily's help here. I'm stuck on the slide. Here we go. Um, medical services uh, for um, students with disabilities. There, I, I mentioned earlier, kind of teased, there is an exception to what I said earlier about not providing doctor's services. And that is when um, the doctor is providing an evaluative service. So in an evaluation, a school could be obligated to pay for um, an, a medical evaluation. This is the only time when you're, a school is actually paying a doctor. So you don't pay doctors to do routine services. You do perhaps pay doctors to evaluate students. And that's something that, that's a decision that's made on the, through the domain process as far as what information is needed to, to um, treat a student or to um, plan for a student. So if your team says, really, we need medical information in order to know what to put in the IEP or 504 plan, parents do not have to consent to giving you the medical information they might have from, parent, from private providers. In that situation where you, or, or perhaps you don't think the medical information that you're getting is robust enough or specific enough to the concerns of the school team, 
Um, the district then is required to fund that, but it, it is a piece of information you're, requ you're allowed to, you're both allowed to get it, but then must pay for it, if that makes sense. And then from there, we'll go to related services. So again, um, this is, now we're out of the realm of an evaluation. We're talking about actual day-to-day -day service provision. So school nurse uh, and school health services are related services that the district's required to. And I'm going to use the same line. Essentially what's been codified in the regulations is um, if only a doctor can do it, it's not a school health service. If it's something a nurse or a layperson can be trained to do, then it is something to be done in school. A lot of times from the nursing perspective, it, it could be medication management, overseeing that process at school, um, you know, regular health monitoring. Um, and then also the other types of services when we're talking about um, the G-tube, um, those kinds of more extensive services, can be, it can be someone trained, uh, such a, as a para, because again, parents can be trained, so staff can be trained. So we do have a couple of questions that have popped up when we have a couple minutes. Um, two of the quick housekeeping ones, um, we were asked to just restate the name of our special education blog, which is special ed lawinsights.com. So special ed lawinsights.com. Um, and then if someone said that they joined us late, so this will be available by recording. Um, you should get emailed a link and a survey um, to be able to access these later. Um, we are also po posting some of our um, webinars on our new podcast, so you can also look for us there, kind of wherever you get your podcasts now. Um, we did get a question, what is the appropriate supply to be kept in the RN's office regarding medical cannabis? And this is going to be an issue driven by the information you get from the medical provider, which should give quantity information. Um, so, and you're going to want to stay, obviously, within bounds of, of that and what's authorized. We're also looking for ISB to release regulations. A lot of these things, um, if it's not directly in the law, we're, we're, in a wait, we're in a little bit of a holding pattern. Hopefully the regulations will detail more of that practical, how do we implement this law. Um, unfortunately, anyone who is in this area knows ISB, I, I have a, a soft spot in my heart for them right now. They must be, there are so many new laws and so many new regulations that people, you know, there's no way, I'm sure. Overtime. They're working overtime, and even if they're working overtime, we can, you know, only expect so much so fast. So it's not something we've seen yet. I think that's a critical thing for anyone to consider before really we go full-fledged ahead with um, implementation. We also had another question asking if there's any legal risk to districts that choose not to carry undesignated medications. Um, and the example that was given is in DuPage, there's a standing order from the county that prescribes undesignated EpiPens and states that only an RN can give undesignated EpiPens. So it kind of is in conflict with um, what we're talking about in the school code. So the school code says that, the, that school districts may maintain um, undesignated supplies of asthma, EpiPen, opioid antagonists, or glucagons, that does not mean that you have to do so. Um, what we've been kind of talking about with some of our clients is if you're not already prepared to do this um, and you're not already, if you don't already have the supplies of undesignated medication, you're not ready to go full force, um, don't do it yet um, because you know, this, it does kind of bring along a lot of extra steps for how to maintain, how to supply it, how to store it and administer it pro appropriately, but um, as far as I'm aware, there's, there's not a legal risk necessarily for not doing it because this, the provisions in the school code only give you the option to. Right, that's going to be a community decision really on if it's a support you want to provide to your school community, if it, it's weighing a lot of pros and cons there, and if you're going to do it, like Emily said, don't do it haphazard. It's something that requires a significant amount of planning. Um, to ensure that you're you're following all the requirements. So with that, um, 
I, I, we're to the end. Our next webinar, so thank you for joining us. We do put out monthly webinars. Our next one is on February 11th, and that will focus on religion in school. So look forward to uh, next month and that, that webinar. Thank you. Thanks.